are you really? That's what we're asking this final night of the labels series that we're in. Who are you really? There's a lot of ways you can define yourself. There's a lot of ways you can look at yourself and say, this is who I am. There's a lot of ways you can present yourself to the world, to those around you, to your friends at school. There's a lot of ways that we try to sell ourselves and brand ourselves. But who are you really? That's the question I want to ask tonight. Who are you really? The truth is, when we look at ourselves, sometimes we may not actually know who we are. A lot of times, all of the, the stuff that we do, all of the things that we go through, all of the outward things that we've talked about in the past couple weeks, sometimes we do all of these things as an attempt to find who we really are. So we, we get the Jordans, we get the, the newest clothes, we get the new phone, we get whatever, and we say, man, that's me. I'm just doing me. And we, we do all of these things, and not that it's wrong to have Jordans or new clothes or anything like that, but at the end of the day, that's not really you, and you know that. Those are just material items. Who you are is something far different than the clothes you wear, than even the people you surround yourself with. You are uh, something that's far greater than those things. Sometimes we look at ourselves and we're like, I don't even know who I am, I'm kind of confused. And, and in fact, sometimes we look at ourselves and, and we see, you know what? That's a nice thunder. Sometimes we look at ourselves and we say, you know what? I don't really like who I see. I look in the mirror and I don't really like who I see. I mean, maybe you look in the mirror and this is a good year, good ages. And I've talked about this before. White people get pimples. Um, but I don't know if, if everybody does. But, you know, you can get the pimples, you get the face. Like, man, I wish my nose was this. I wish my, my had that sort of... You ever do that? You might be honest, confess, you look in the mirror like, eh, I don't like that about myself. Or maybe when you get older, you look in the mirror and you're like, dude, what happened to the six pack that I had when I was 18? Or at least a four pack, or you know, it was close. I mean, it's not anywhere close now. It's just a big round thing. So you can look in the mirror and be like, man, I don't like myself, but you can look past the mirror. Hopefully you do that sometimes. You look past the surface and you say, you know what? I don't even like who I am on the inside. You ever done that? You looked at you know, look past the surface, you know, whether you got a, a, a freckle in the wrong place or, you, you know, you're flabby or whatever. You just kind of look at your own soul. Sometimes you get a window into that. So, you know what? I don't even really like what's going on in there. And, and that's, that's where we are. In reality, as teenagers and as people all through life, we're going to look at ourselves and ask, man, who really, who am I? And the important thing tonight is, is not that... It's not that what other people say about you really counts. Although sometimes you can get some good feedback from people. You should totally ignore people. If everybody says you're a major jerk, probably you're a major jerk. It's probably not just other people. Okay? So sometimes what people say, you, you can listen to it with a grain of salt. But that's not, the, that's not the end of the day. That's not the end of the story. It's not what truly matters. But it's not even what you feel or what you think on, in your own heart. What really matters on who you really are. It matters what God says. What does He say? And so tonight, what, what does God say? If you look at the Bible, if you had a chance to read through the whole thing, you get just this broad picture of what God says about people, about human beings, about humanity. What He says about us has very little to do with our race, all the different races that we have represented here, all the different ethnicities, wonderful and awesome. It has very little to do with how old or young or in between you are has very little to do with your gender, male, female, has very little to do with it. Do you have a skill, a talent, ability, which, side note, commercial time, next week if you do have a skill, talent, or ability, you'll have five minutes to present that up here on the stage for open mic night. Just thought I'd pass that your way. Or if you have a friend at school with a skill, talent, or ability up here in five minutes, it's a lot of fun. Back to the sermon. It has very little to do with your popularity, your status. It has very little, the way God sees us, honestly, has very little to do with even the good things we accomplish or the bad things we do. Sometimes we think that's the end of the world. That's a make or break. If I can just do some good things or just stop doing some bad things, then that's going to change everything and God's going to see me and, and smile on me or, or whatever. But honestly, what He 
says about us and how he sees us has everything to do with, let me just give you some initials. Maybe this is memorable, maybe it's not. Whether you're AC or IC. Whether you're AC or IC. Whether you're apart from Christ or whether you're in Christ. It's not AC, DC. I thought some of you guys were going to be silent. Not in this, this room, but another room somewhere else. AC or IC. Are you apart from Christ or are you in Christ? That's what really matters. That's what really matters. Apart from Christ, this is what the Bible says. Those who are apart from Christ, the picture really isn't very pretty. If you look in the mirror and you are apart from Christ, the Bible doesn't say a whole lot of great things uh, about you. The Bible says basically this, that we're sinful apart from Christ, that we're spiritually dead, and that we're the object of God's anger. That doesn't sound very good. That's kind of bad news. You know what I'm saying? That's, that's not the most happy stuff you want to hear when you come into a church building. The Bible says apart from Christ, we are all sinful. We are all spiritually dead. And we're all the objects of God's anger. But check this out. It's going to get better. Let's read this. Ephesians 2, 1 to 10. We're going to turn there. If you have a Bible, this is what a Bible, one, one version of a Bible looks like this. Um, if you have one, bring one. I suggest you bring one. If you don't have one, we can give you a free one. If you don't own a Bible, there's these orange ones or yellow, whatever that color is, up here. And those are free. Um, if you need one, someone could hand these out. Thanks, Daniel. Um, it's our gift to you. Take it home and you can read it. And you can have it. We're going to look at Ephesians 2, 1 to 10 tonight. So turn there. Um, if you didn't have a Bible, we can't get them all out. It's going to be up on the screen as well. This is what it says in the New Living Translation. Once you were dead. Once you were dead. I was dead, but I'm alive. This was once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. You used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil. The commander of the powers of the unseen world. He is the spirit in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way. Following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger. Just like everyone else. This is a very bad picture of who we are. We're sinful, we're spiritually dead, and we're subject to the anger of God. This is, this is not good. But check this out. It keeps going. This is what it says. Verse 4. But God. Everybody say, but God. Say again, but God. But God. It's good. It's a good but right there. All right? All right? It's not that. Appreciate it. Thanks. But God is so rich in mercy that he loved us so much that even though when we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. For he raised us from the dead, along with Christ, and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. When we're in Christ, there's good stuff going on. Verse 7, so God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace, kindness toward us, as shown in all he has done for us, who are united with Christ Jesus. Verse 8, God saved you by His grace when you did good things. No, that's not what it says. When you came to church that one time, when you got ice cream on your face, when you dressed up like a clown at the harvest party when you were seven. That was me. That was me. Okay. Um, no, it says He saved you by His grace when you believed. When you believed. Not when you stopped cussing. Although again, probably should stop. Some people get offended. It's not when you stop doing all the bad stuff, start doing all the good stuff. This is what it says. God saved you by His grace when you believed. This is what it says. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation, life, being a child of God is a gift from God. You don't learn anything at all about the Bible, about who God is. E.J., if you don't learn anything tonight, appreciate the Bills having that. That's nice. If you don't learn anything at all, please know that you are not saved by becoming a good person. This is saying very clearly that you are saved because you believe, because you trust, because you put your hope, your faith in the person of Jesus Christ. That all of your faith, all of your hope is in that and that, that alone. 
That's what the Bible makes very clear, that we are not saved because we become good people. But when we put our faith, our hope, everything we have into Jesus Christ, the Bible says we will become good people. That we will become who God wants us to be. So let's continue to read this. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. Verse 9. So none of us can boast about it. But we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things He planned for us long ago. The Bible says here that who are you? Who are you really? Apart from Christ, you're spiritually dead. You're sinful. You're maybe possibly God's mad at you. But because He's not just an angry God, He's a loving God, He shows His grace to you. And he sends his son. And that when you're in Christ, when you put your faith, hope, and trust in Christ, you are God's masterpiece. You're his masterpiece. Now, I don't know if, if you guys are artists or if you guys are uh, possibly have some artistic ability. I'm looking at someone of Frankie's got some artistic ability. Leslie, thank you for finishing these signs the other day. That was very nice of you. Um, some of you guys are artistic and you, you can kind of understand the idea of masterpiece. I have no artistic ability with my hands. Okay, I'm going to mess it up. But you think of an artist or, or, or a craftsman putting together something, doing their very best, working on it. That's what God is doing with your life when you are in Christ. He picks up the pieces of your life, everything that's there, maybe the mess that you've made, and says, you know what, son, daughter, I can do something with that. Even though it looks like you've goofed it all up, just give it to me. I'm going to make something out of it. I'm the master craftsman. I am, I'm the one who can, who can do something with what you give me. And the second thing that I want you to know tonight, not just that you're God's masterpiece, here's something I want you to remember. Write this down if you're taking notes. When you know who you are, when you know who you are, some of us, man, we're not really sure, but when you really kind of settle in on who you are, you'll know what to do. When you know who you are, you'll know what to do. When you begin to understand who you really are, what God says about your life, your identity in Christ, your life, the course of your life, the decisions you need to make, the things that are ahead of you will become a little bit more clear. When you don't know who you really are, you are not going to know what to do. You're going to go through life just guessing, just trying to, I'm going to try this, I'm going to do that, I'm going to see about this, maybe this relationship, maybe this over here would work out. Everything that you're going to do is just a stab in the dark. But when you find your identity in Christ, when you find who you really are, what God says about your life, you will begin to know what your life is supposed to do. It's not an immediate download all in one second, but it is some clarity that God will give you in your life. One of the best examples of this, I believe, is the story of Gideon in the Old Testament, in Judges chapter 6. I'm not going to turn there and read it all. But I do want to just highlight a few uh, things that happened in the story of Gideon. You may not be familiar with this guy, so we'll just really quick kind of go over what this guy did. Gideon was an Israelite. He was one of the, the people of God at that time. Uh, he was living in a time where the people of God were uh, oppressed, where the Midianites were coming in and stealing all of their grain, all of their food, and they were living in a very difficult time. It was very hard. And so what had happened, these people, instead of fighting against this, instead of turning to God, they just kind of ran and cowered and and they were scared. The Bible even says that they were hiding in the mountains and in caves. And they did not turn to God, nor did they try to fight the enemy. They just kind of ran away from their problems. A lot of times we do that when we have problems. We don't attack it head on, nor do we even turn to God. We just kind of try to run away from it. And so here's Gideon. We find him in Judges chapter 6. He's actually in what's known as a wine press. It's kind of an indention in the ground. And he's down hiding in there, threshing grain. It's not normally where you would thresh grain, but apparently he's trying to hide from these people that were trying to steal everything. So he's down here doing this work, hiding. He's probably very uh, afraid and scared. We find this guy Gideon. Uh, he's in bad shape. But the Bible says in Judges uh, 6.15 that, that the angel of the Lord appears, shows up, and wants to meet with this guy. So they have this encounter, and, and when, when God shows up through this angel, the, the first thing this angel says is that, Gideon, you are a mighty man of valor, one translation says. Or you're a mighty warrior. You're a great hero. One of the most um, ironic, maybe awkward moments where Gideon's like, who are you talking to? Because that's not me. I'm scared. You know, I'm, I'm really afraid of what's going on. I'm actually sitting here in a, in a wine press. I'm hiding. 
Uh, I'm not a mighty man of valor. What are you talking about? I don't see myself like that. Let me read you what he says. Because the angel says, hey, you're a mighty man of valor, Gideon. I want you to go and save this, this people of Israel. I want you to go do it. He's like, what? This is what Gideon says. Verse, verse 15 there. Says, Gideon replied, but how can I rescue Israel? My clan is the weakest one in Manasseh. And everyone else in my family is more important than I am. So he's saying, what? I'm the weakest. I mean, we're the nobodies, and I'm, I'm the nobody of the nobodies. I, I can't do this. God, what are you talking about? See, Gideon, well, the way he saw himself was, was I'm a nobody. You know, that, that's just who I am. I can't get things done. I can't accomplish this. There's not great things ahead of me. I'm just resorting to these things in my life because that's all it's ever going to be. My life is going to exist at this level because that's just what it is. That's who I am. But God shows up in his life and says, you know what, dude? That's not who you are. You're a mighty man of valor. You're a mighty warrior. And you're going to, you're going to save Israel. I want to use you, buddy. And it, he had a hard time believing this. He had a real hard time. Actually, if you read on in the story, he's like, wait, let me test this out. And so he goes through all these little things with God. Let me do this. And if you say this and this happens, then I'll know. And he goes through all these things trying to just make sure God knows what he's talking about. And God's patient with him. He goes through Gideon's tests and look, if you do this and then I'll know you're really telling me the truth. God's patient with him. And finally Gideon gets to a place where he's starting to take steps in the right direction. God gives him a little thing to do. He doesn't say, all right, uh, you're a mighty warrior. Now go attack him. Here's a sword. Go. He starts giving him small things to do. And he's like, okay, first I want you to take care of the idols that are in your own house. Your own family is not even worshiping me. You're, you guys are worshiping another God. What's up with that? I want you to take care of these idols, get, get rid of them. He's like, all right, well, I'm going to stand up to that. So he stands up this small, just in his own house, in his own local area. He's just, you know, I'm going to stand up and do what's right. Small act of obedience. As he does that, he gets boldness, he gets strength, he gets courage, he becomes what God sees him as. And he goes on from there, he begins to gather up men around him, gather up an army. And as the story goes, God uses him to, to vanquish these enemies, even with just 300 people. He has a, a massive army, 30,000 people. And God says, you have too many people. Just get rid of them, all these people. So he wipes it all the way back down to 300. And God says, I guess it's the original 300, right? And so God uses these people. And they take out the enemy and, and everybody is saved. But it didn't just happen all of a sudden. You're a mighty warrior. Oh, yeah, cool. Let's go do it. It was a process. And such it is with us. When God speaks things into our lives, you hear something in the youth service on a Wednesday night and September 2011 that, man, you know, maybe I'm not just an average ordinary teenager. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm not just, you know, whoever. Maybe I'm not just a loser. Or maybe I'm not just second place. Maybe I'm not just all these things I've thought about myself my whole life. Maybe I'm not just that person that could never really live up to what other people think or what my parents think or their expectations. Maybe there actually is something that God sees in me that I don't even see in myself. When Gideon meets with God, he begins to believe what God says about him, and his life begins to change. God, you are God's masterpiece, created in Christ Jesus to, to do good things that God has planned for you long ago. You are God's masterpiece. And what else does he say? Let me give you three things, and we'll wrap it up tonight. Not only does God say that we are his masterpiece, but what it means to be his masterpiece, let me just give you three things. Here's number one. We're a new creation. We're a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says this. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old is gone and the new has begun. Anyone who belongs to Christ, who you place your faith in Christ, you become a new person. A new person. Now you're not like a, a new name, like you change and all this stuff and you don't even know who you are anymore. But things begin to change in your life. You're not the old you. You're not the old you anymore. And even though you may feel like the old you in a lot of ways, you feel like, I still have some of the same struggles, I still am tempted in these ways. The Bible says you are a new person. You have a new strength. You have a new power. You have a new source. You have a new way of living that you begin to step into. You don't necessarily realize it all in one moment, but God is beginning to change you and make you a new person. And I shared this on Friday, and I think it's a, a good statement. You can write this down. What is true about you today? You may look at yourself and say, man, I know I'm not that great of a person. I, I can look at myself, and these are true things. Man, I'm struggling with this. I'm doing that. And you may know that, but what's true about you today does not have to be true about you tomorrow. What's true about you today does not have to be true about you tomorrow. In Christ, you are a new creation. 
The old is gone and the new has come. God has made you a new person in Christ. Number two, not only we're a new person, not only can we change, there's hope for us, but number two, we're an overcomer. Romans chapter 8 puts it this way, verses 31 on to 37 says, If God is for us, who can be against us? He did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Verse 35 says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble, or hardship, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loves us, through Christ who loves us. The Bible says that we are an overcomer. We are more than a conqueror. The word there in the Greek is conqueror with, with the, the prefix huper, or super. You're like a superhero, a super conqueror. That's what the Bible says. We are more than a conqueror through him who loves us. There's nothing that can separate us from the love of God. And there's nothing that is in your life that can keep you down forever. Whatever struggle you're facing, whatever thing that you have that seems so insurmountable, feels like it's impossible to overcome, there's nothing in your life that's going to keep you down forever when you're in Christ. There's nothing that can overcome you to the point where you're destroyed. If God is for you, who can be against you? That's what the Bible says. We are overcomers. That's what he says who we are. Who are you really? In Christ, I'm an overcomer. In Christ, I'm a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. The Bible says in Revelation, over and over, that we overcome by the blood of the Lamb, what He's done for us, and the word of our testimony. When we share, when we begin to speak out what God is doing in our lives, we begin to verbalize these things, we begin to be bold about these things, we begin to see overcoming uh, virtue in our lives. We can get past certain things. A lot of times we're quiet, we're struggling with something, we don't want to tell anybody, we don't want to get involved, we just kind of bottle it all up. We can just continue to struggle with the same things. Or we say, you know what? Jesus has died for this. I don't have to be a slave to this. And I can overcome this by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of my testimony. And your testimony may be, dude, I'm struggling. That's where I'm at. That may be your testimony. Your testimony may, may be right now, man, my life's a mess. That's your testimony. But you're being real. You're being honest. You're being upfront, And God can use that. You can work in that. If you just want to share that, say that God, say it maybe to another, another person. Say, you know, listen, man, this is where I'm at. I'm struggling. I need help. And we overcome by what Christ has done for us and by being real, by sharing our testimony. And when we get a victory, we begin to, to do better and we share that with others. It builds faith in them to say, you know what? Maybe, maybe, I can, maybe I can have victory too. The Bible says that we don't fight with the weapons of this world. We have weapons that have divine power to conquer strongholds. And finally, number three tonight, not only are we a new creation in Christ, are we an overcomer? Who are you really? You are in Christ, a disciple. The term Christian can have such a negative ring to it. A lot of times people don't even, uh, when they think of a Christian, they have a lot of negative connotations because they've seen Christians, so to speak, quote-unquote Christians that maybe haven't been a great example or maybe haven't even been at all serious or at all even committed to what they're saying or even understood what that means. A lot of people can slap on the label, I'm a Christian, and, and really it means nothing. Just something you slap on, even on forms that you'll fill out at the hospital, or forms that you'll fill out for the military, or a lot of places, you got to pick some label. What are you? Are you this, this, or this? Oh, I'm Christian. That's what I am. What does it mean? I don't know, but that's what I am. I think a lot of times when, when we've done that in our culture, we become a Christianized culture, it loses its meaning. The label is, is useless. And the Bible, interesting enough, the Bible never even calls us very often Christians. The first time Christian was ever used is in the book of Acts, and it was actually a kind of a name-calling opportunity for people outside the faith. Oh, you think you're just like Jesus, ha, ha, ha. That's when it was used as, and people kind of assumed it later on. But the term you'll find most in the Bible is disciple. Over and over again, the followers of Jesus are disciples. The Greek word for disciple uh, is mathetes. It basically means a learner, a student, or a follower. Being a disciple is so much more than just slapping the label on saying, yeah, I'm one of those Christian people or whatever, whatever that means. It's so much more than that. It's a follower, a learner, a student. It's much more than just believing something. I believe that there's a God and something like that. When you're in Christ, you're more than just slap the label. Okay, you're in Christ. Good for you. But you begin to follow after God. It's a lifestyle, not just a label. Being, being a follower of Jesus is a lifestyle, not a label. 
Being a disciple means that we, we live how Jesus lived. We love how he loved, and we do what he did. John 13, 35 says this, By this will all men know that you are my disciples, this is Jesus speaking, if you love one another. By this will all men know you are my disciples if you love one another. One of the most important things about being a disciple of Jesus is, is having God's love fill your heart. Having his love fill your heart. And, and we need that. The Bible says love comes from God. A lot of times we are low on love. I know I am sometimes. Get home from work. My kids. Got four of them now. It's a lot. <laughs> People looking at me funny even now. Uh, you know, it, it is a lot. And sometimes I'm low on love. And I need the love of God to fill my heart because I don't have any more. You know what I'm saying? I, I'm just done. I, I'm impatient. I just want to do me. And that's pretty selfish. But that's just where I'm at. And I think if you're honest, you probably get there sometimes too. And we need the love of God to fill our lives. And we go to school, man. I'll be real. When I was in high school, it, it took me a long, long time to even start thinking about loving people in high school. I was just trying to impress people. I was just trying to you know, make friends and you know, be in this crowd or that crowd. I wasn't even thinking on that level. And I've missed out on so many opportunities God brought my way because I was thinking I was somebody else than who I really was. I was thinking, oh, I'm a Christian, but I'm really a disciple. And disciples are known for their love. Disciples are known for their concern for others. By this will all men know that you're my disciples if you love one another. What does it mean to be a disciple? You find a need and you meet it. You find a hurt and you heal it. And it means that you listen and obey the voice of God. John 10, 27, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. We listen to the voice of Jesus. We, we try to do what he says. That's what God wants for our lives. Being a disciple is more than just the label that you take on as a Christian. It's, it's a lifestyle that God has for you. When you know who you are, you will know what to do. As we wrap it up tonight, I don't know if you're facing tough choices. Maybe you got some decisions you have to make. And I'm saying, if you know who you are, if you believe what God says, if you're in Christ, it should color how you make these decisions. Maybe you're facing a little bit of persecution, so to speak. Maybe people are getting on your case. You're like, hey, maybe I'll just quiet down and just, you know, I'm not going to be all loud for God or nothing. I'm just going to kind of blend in. When you know who you are, you'll know what to do. Maybe you're facing temptation. Maybe you're facing a difficulty and you're like, man, what do I do? When you know who God says you are, you'll know what to do. When you're facing a crisis, when you're facing something that's beyond your control, when you don't know how to fix it, Maybe you're facing just boredom. You get home every day, you're like, I'm so bored. School stinks, my life's boring, everything's boring. I don't know what men. I'm just going to play Xbox. I'm going to get on Facebook. But you know, when you know who you are, you know what God says you are. Man, I'm a disciple. I'm not just an ordinary teenager. Man, I'm an overcomer. I'm, I'm a new creation. I don't have to just spend all my time playing Xbox, spend all my time on Facebook. Man, God has greater things than that for my life. Not that those things are wrong, but you know what? There's more things than just that in my life. When you have a free weekend, you'll know what to do. When you're, when you're in a conversation with somebody, when you're in a dating relationship with somebody, you'll know what to do. And Judith's still back there. If you hit that for me, I appreciate it. One of my favorite stories, we'll wrap it up with this. One of my favorite stories... Um, kind of come across over the, uh, the years for me. It's a story of, of a sculptor, really the story of two sculptors. It was in the late 14th century in Florence, Italy. Um, there was a sculptor that found this big, huge uh, uh, marble, it's called Carrera marble. He found this stone, he was like, man, I'm going to make something out of this. And, okay, there it is. And so he gets this stone. And he begins to work on this stone. He's like, man, I'm going to make something great out of this thing. I I'm a sculptor. And he starts working, he starts working, and whatever they do with their chisel and their hammer and all this, and he gets to a place where he's like, you know what? Dude, I goofed this up. Man. Whoops. And he just, like, leaves it. And he totally abandons this project. Leaves it in the courtyard of this, 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 uh, this place, and he, it sits there, it sits there for a hundred years, this stone which was beginning to be worked on, but then the, the sculptor left it alone because he said, you know what, I've messed it up far too much. And there's, there's no hope for this. 
there's no hope for this. I'm just going to leave it here. It was nine tons, and I can't move it. I don't want to fool with it. So he passes away, and the stone sits there for years and years and years. But along comes another sculptor, a hundred years later, a sculptor by the name of Michelangelo. And he takes this stone, and he looks at it, and he sees it from a different perspective than anybody else has seen for over a hundred years. And he, and he looks at the stone and says, you know what, I think I can actually do something with this. Because when I see it, I, I see a masterpiece inside of that. When I see this stone, I, I actually see, I see David in there. And for three years, he chisels and chisels and chisels until finally, three years later, the, the, the masterpiece David, you know, the one right there, that guy, can't share the whole thing. It's a little bit uh, off color for a little sermon. And I see his package, that's bad. So, um, but the, the David, he reveals this, this masterpiece that people go and for hundreds and hundreds of years, people have gone and said, man, that's an amazing piece of art. That's an amazing masterpiece that Michelangelo has created. And you know, we're, we're kind of the same way. Because, you know, when we work on ourselves or other people have maybe been working on us, even our parents, and they're chiseling and saying, man, you're something. I, I see something in you. And then sometimes maybe we're working on our life and we get to a certain place. We're like, you know what? I don't even know. I don't even know what could happen in my life. I don't even know where. And maybe we just kind of give up. And maybe we're just kind of sitting there for a while, just lying dormant. We're just doing our, going through the motions. We're just there. But you know what? There is a master who can take your life and can see in your life what no one else can see. He can see the, the things that we may not be able to see, no one else may be able to see. He can see into us these things. And he has the ability not just to see them. He has the ability to design and to create these things in our lives. This is who God is. He's the great artist. He's the great sculptor. Who can work in us whatever he sees, whatever he sees fit, if we will just give him the ability and the opportunity to work in our lives. Let's bow our heads tonight as we close. The truth is, without the master sculptor working on us and in us, we are hopeless men. Apart from Christ, we are spiritually dead. We are sinful. Things don't look good apart from Christ. But God, who is rich in mercy, has made a way so that we can come to Him, that we can have life. And He did that by sending His Son. He did that by letting His Son pay the penalty of our sin, by dying on a cross, bearing our sin on Him, so that we can have His righteousness in exchange. And we access this. We come into this not through figuring out some ritual or, or trying to be really good, but by simple, childlike faith. Say, you know what? That's, that's what I need. That's what I want. I need God. I need His mercy. I need what He's done. I can't do it myself. I can't do it on my own. That's what we need tonight. If you're here tonight with your head bowed and your eyes closed, and you would say, you know what? I came into this place and, you know what, maybe I thought I was this or I thought I was that or maybe I didn't even know who I was. But tonight as I'm sitting here, I'm feeling like God just kind of move on my heart. It's kind of weird almost. That God is just doing something inside and, you know what, I really want Jesus. I want Him to come and fill my life, to, to do what He wants, to be that master sculptor and shape my life how He sees fit. I want Him to fill my life tonight. If that's you... I want you to do something really really bold and really awesome. Just raise your hand. That's you, that's what you want? Raise your hand high. Just for a second. I want to, I want to see your hand. God wants to see it, but he knows your heart. That's more important. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. That's a lot of us tonight. That's a lot of us tonight. Our hearts are, are on a similar place. We need God. To come in and do something in our lives. And I, I don't know, man, I don't know the depths of your heart. And I don't know how deep he's, he's working on you right now. But I can't save you. I can't do anything to make you get saved. But you and God, you can talk to him. You can share your heart to him right now and, and call on his name. The Bible says whoever calls on the name of the Lord, that's Jesus. Whoever calls on his name will be saved. So right now as this music is playing, just kind of in the background... I want to invite you to, to call on His name, to ask Him to fill your life, 
you raised your hand saying that's what you wanted. Now just ask him. Just close out everybody else. Close out whoever else is in this room. And you and God, just talk. Maybe you don't even know how to. I can give you some words to say. You can pray something like, Jesus, uh, I came here tonight. I don't, don't know everything that I, I need to say, but I, I want you in my life. Jesus, I need what you've done for me on the cross. I need, I need that. Please forgive my sins. Please take them away and make me a new person. Help me become what you see and not what others see. Make me a new creation tonight. Help me become an overcomer. Help me be your disciple. I want all of that tonight. I want to change. I want to be who you want me to be. Just pray something like that tonight in this moment. Thank you, Jesus, for filling this place tonight. I thank you, God, for those who are seeking you right now. Those who are reaching out to you from their own hearts, praying their own prayers to you. God, I pray that you would, you would hear their cries. And Lord, you would welcome them into your family tonight. You'd welcome them into your family tonight. Lord, bring the change. Lord, we are in Christ. We are a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. Lord, I pray that that will be a reality in many lives tonight. The new has come. The old is gone. Lord, I pray they would hear that with so much clarity. The old is gone. The new has come. God, you are making us new people. The past is gone. Today is a new day. Lord, you're going to begin a new thing in us tonight, tomorrow, the next day. As we follow you, as we seek to be your disciple more than anything else. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Jesus. If you want to finish up tonight with just some time in prayer, we do this here every Wednesday. We've been doing this for, for several months. We'll dismiss. If you want to go, you got to go. You have to go, whatever. That's cool. But if you want to just spend some time in prayer, uh, there's other students, some leaders here that are happy to pray with you if you like that. But if you want to come up to the front, it's per perfectly great to do that. Even if you just want to chill in your seat for a little bit, just kind of spend some time in prayer. Sometimes that's really what we need more than just bolting it out the door. But we love you. Thank you for coming tonight. If you got to go, God bless you. Have an awesome week. But if you, if you need some time with the Lord a little bit more, this is your time to do it.